Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the All Saints podcast. So we finished last week looking at the topic of pursuing maturity in Christ, where we've been following along with a bunch of uh, Wednesday night Bible studies here at All Saints, uh, a couple of men's discipleship breakfasts, including the one that kicked it off, the kind of manifesto for what we were going to be looking at. That's taken us a couple of months or so. And this last week at Wednesday night Bible study, uh, we spent a little bit of time uh, reflecting on a biblical basis for the possibility of learning from unbelievers, uh, particularly from the writings of unbelievers, some of the practical things that might be helpful for us in taking some steps towards building helpful structures in our lives, in, us, in areas of our lives that currently lack those structures. Just to recall and take a step back, uh, you remember that uh, one of the things I suggested right at the heart, really, of the last couple of months uh, when we've been thinking about uh, the task of uh, patching up those areas of our life where we're not as mature in Christ as we feel we ought to be, uh, is to reinstantiate, if you like, some of the structures of uh, childlike life in order to rebuild in ourselves some fruitful habits and reshape our character in positive directions. I'm not going to rehash uh, all of that because um, you can go back and listen to me talk about that and uh, some of the great discussions that we've had in the men's discipleship breakfasts and Bible studies about that. But if you've been following along, you'll um, uh, know where we're coming from. You'll also know that I've remarked on a couple of occasions that one of the most difficult things to do in the complex situations that we find ourselves in in adult life is to actually build appropriate structures in, in domains as complex as family relationships and the workplace and how we use our time and issues that intersect with physical health and exercise and mental health issues and so on. And so one of the things that is raised as a consequence of this is the question, well, to what extent is it helpful to learn some of the details of how we might helpfully build those structures from sources outside the Bible? And the answer is, I think it is potentially helpful, but to do so needs to be, the, the process by which we justify doing so needs to be thought through quite carefully. Uh, and so in today's podcast, I'm going to be uh, giving you a chance to listen to a uh, uh, talk and a discussion that uh, we did at this last week at Wednesday Night Bible Study again, uh, where I critique the idea of natural law as a basis for learning from the unbelieving world and instead articulate an alternative, I think more biblical justification for learning a great deal uh, from people who are not believers, uh, who may be indeed hostile to the Christian faith, but who nonetheless are living in God's world, uh, have discovered either uh, just in God's good providence or secondhand unacknowledged from, they've picked up things from uh, the Christian shaped society in which we still live. Uh, one way or another, God's truth has filtered out into the non-Christian world in such a way that Christians may indeed benefit from it. And right at the end of uh, the Bible study, I go through a list of things that I personally have learned from uh, this big pile of books over here. Um, which you can, there's a couple of piles, actually, another one over here. Um, uh, and in a, in a sense, uh, the illustration I use is to say that these are unintentional sermons, uh, deep reflections on uh, biblical texts, and I quote a bunch of biblical texts like Ecclesiastes 9, 9 uh, 10, um, whatever your hand finds to do, work at it with all your might, and a bunch of Proverbs and a couple of New Testament texts, which if we had world enough and time and all the godliness and all the wisdom that we could possibly uh, ask for, we would be able to reflect on and get to the point of detailed, nitty-gritty, practical outcomes. But in fact, we don't do that. In fact, our understanding is limited, but uh, in God's good kindness, uh, there are resources out there in the world, sometimes in the not in professedly Christian literature uh, and other resources that may be helpful to us. So uh, you'll hear my uh, warrant and justification for availing ourselves of those resources and many others besides in the Bible study and discussion that follows. Uh, but I thought what it might be helpful to do, just to spend a minute or two, uh, I'll, I'll just go through the titles and maybe say a word or two about one or two of the books, but go through the titles of books that I that I mentioned and alluded to in the um, uh, at the end of the Bible study, which is now at the end of this podcast, because I realised I didn't actually read all the titles um, out uh, and therefore, if you're listening to this on a podcast, uh, you won't know what it is I'm talking about. I, I should say, just by way of um, one final caveat, I'm not really recommend. oh no, two final caveats actually, I'm not really recommending these books as such. I'm just saying, look, these are things I've found helpful and which seem to me at certain points, not universally, but at certain points to indicate practical directions in which uh, Christians might find it helpful to uh, reflect um, 
uh, in ways which resonate with biblical teaching. That's one caveat. Uh, the other caveat, of course, is to say that the list I provided was not exhaustive. For example, I didn't mention a couple of books over here behind me. Um, Pluck, Rose and Lindsay. Can you see that one? Yeah, you can see that one. Um, Pluck, Rose and Lindsay, uh, Cynical Theories, uh, an outstanding critique of um, the critical social justice movement. Uh, there's another book by um, Pincourt and Lindsay, which is uh, a more practical guide to dealing with the critical social justice movement. I found both of those profoundly helpful. I think James Lindsay is a lapsed Catholic, and I don't know whether Pincourt is a believer at all, and uh, he gives no indication of it. Um, but, you know, they're, they're useful. There's wisdom out there in the world, but to, to uh, imbibe it and to try and make use of it requires us to be quite careful in doing so. And just to summarise before we jump into the titles again, uh, I don't want to commend a natural law justification for this, but something that's su somewhat more subtle, I think, uh, but nonetheless finds in scripture a justification for taking seriously the wisdom that we might find even in Athens, not just in Jerusalem. So with that all said, uh, let me just uh, run through a few of these titles and then, then you'll know where I'm uh, referring to when we get to the end of the podcast and I read through a bunch of things that I personally have learned. These unintentional sermons on aspects of biblical teaching. So uh, here's a great book, um, uh, Luke Yarnoff and Height, The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. That's great at articulating why and how it's important for people to be challenged in the practical realities of life, not to be coddled and babied and so on. Now this is a great book, The Case for Working with Your Hands, or why office work is bad for us and fixing things feels good. Um, personally, I uh, love doing stuff with my hands in the evenings. When I've when I've done in the office here, I spend most of my day either uh, reading books, praying about books, or talking to people. And all of that is quite mentally intense. So I love doing practical things like baking bread and making things out of wood very amateurishly because it's kind of interesting, it's demanding, but it's not cognitively demanding. And this book actually explains one a whole bunch of reasons why doing things with our hands feels rewarding. And it resonates in all kinds of interesting ways with biblical teaching about creation and so on and so forth, even though the author isn't writing as a Christian, and I don't think is a Christian. Um, Lead Yourself First, Inspiring Leadership Through Solitude. It's probably longer than it needs to be, this book. Um, and uh, it's, uh, well, Inspiring Leadership Through Solitude. You know, that's a subtitle, that'll give you enough um, uh, guidance about what it's about. The Power of Habit, why we do what we do and how to change. This is a little bit like this great book by um, James Clear. This is a top bestseller, really, Atomic Habits. Um, that really resonates very strongly with what we've been talking about in the last couple of months about the value of small, uh, habitual, practical changes to our daily routines building up over time and shaping our character. Neither of those guys are writing as Christians, but um, both of them have things to say which resonate with biblical teaching. Let me get this off the desk. <clears throat> Otherwise, I'm going to be getting... getting um, uh, all tangled up with him. Uh, this one's hilarious. Ten Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now by Jared Lanier. Let's say no more about that one. Flow. This is the book that started off, really, the um, personal productivity movement from the perspective of neuroscience and neurology. It's by Mikhaili, Mikhaili Csikszentmihalyi, um, who uh, is a psychologist and really quite a famous and uh, prolific one. Uh, and um, here he uh, describes and analyzes what he calls the, the optimal experience of deep absorption in something. And if you've ever been working at a task like your schoolwork or academic work or your study or whatever it is, or working at your desk in the office, and two hours have just flown past and you've got loads done and you think, where did the time go? And you realize it was quite rewarding. Well, this book will explain why and how to capture that uh, kind of diligent application to what it is that you're doing in, in a productive way. Um, distracted by Maggie Jackson, uh, a bit more of a diffuse book, it's not brilliant book I don't think, but it's nonetheless uh, helpful uh, and highlights some of the things that uh, I'll mention a little bit later. That's another book which I'm beating the college debt trap, I think that got into the pile for another reason to do with my 18 year old son. Um, anyway, I'll come, come back to the distracted thing in a second. This is a fascinating book, uh, Nassim Talib, Anti-Fragile, he's written a whole bunch of books which, um, uh, well really, uh, Anti-Fragile, Black Swan, there's a couple of others, um, fooled by randomness is one of them. Uh, Anti-fragile uh, helpfully highlights the distinction between uh, things that break when you subject them to uh, shock, uh, illustration a china vase or a china cup or something, uh, things that aren't harmed but aren't helped like 
a tennis ball, you drop it and it just bounces back up, and things which are helped and strengthened by being exposed to adverse circumstances. And human beings are one such thing. And so he talks about a whole range of different issues, um, uh, everything from kind of stock markets uh, to human physiology, and highlights how um, one of the, the ways in which we improve our ability to withstand the difficulties and hardships of everyday life is to expose ourselves systematically to them. And it's just really intriguing. Nassim Talib is, I mean, he describes himself as a, as a Christian, but really he's, uh, he means simply that he was born in a, in a part of the world where he's a Christian as opposed to Muslim. Uh, if you read it, you're, you're uh, Muslim or Jewish. Uh, if you read it, you'll get grips with that. And he has a, a particular style of writing. I wouldn't recommend him to everybody. At times you find profanity and, and so on in books of his. But if you are um, willing to turn a, uh, your eyes away from that and, and still try and uh, pull out the stuff that's helpful, it's tremendously stimulating. And like I said, it's not a Christian book at all. Uh, but it's very, very wide ranging. The summary I've given you is very um, brief and uh, it doesn't really capture the whole thing, but you'll find in here themes which are tremendously insightful. And as you reflect on them in the way I'm going to encourage you to do later in this podcast, uh, you may find all kinds of things helpful. All right. Um, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, Nobel Prize winning uh, behavioral economist. Uh, it turns out that many of the decisions we make are really, really bad for really predictable reasons. And um, Daniel Kahneman explains why that is. Um, uh, rest. Uh, why you get more work done when you work less. That's a provocative and slightly foolish subtitle, I think. Um, but it does highlight the fact that um, in the real world of work, uh, people are discovering the wisdom of the Lord's commands about rest and uh, uh, not... You know, it's, it's vain that you rise up early in the morning and go late to rest because he gives to his beloved sleep. Well, um, this author, Alex Shujun Kim Pang, doesn't acknowledge that text. But again, many of the things that he's saying seem to me an unintentional set of reflections on themes associated with what the Bible says about rest. He doesn't talk about Sabbath. He doesn't talk about worship. He doesn't talk about honouring the Lord in doing so. But you'll find here practical things which intersect with Christian teaching in that helpful way. Okay, what else we got? Um, Cal Newport. Um, deep work. Um, Newport highlights uh, ways in which uh, our economy is changing so that the kind of work that is now valued and certainly remuneratively valued is the kind of work that human beings can only do by being focused entirely on one thing. And so it goes alongside the work by Maggie Jackson about distraction. If you're constantly having your attention fragmented every 47 seconds by your phone beeping at you or by somebody interrupting you or by you checking your email or something, you're not likely to be doing much of this kind of work. So you're not going to be as productive as you could be. Um, whatever your hand finds to do, work at it with all your might rather than whatever the world throws at you, be distracted by it and give your fragmented attention to things for 38 or 47 seconds at a time. Again, um, I think Cal Newport may be a Christian, I'm not sure about that, but the, the things he's talking about in here have all kinds of intriguing resonances with scriptural themes. And if we read it with an informed, careful, judicious, critical mindset then we may learn all kinds of useful things from it what else have we got oh this is a surprising one to find in this list david barnson uh the case for dividend growth investing in a post-crisis world what on earth is this doing here let me tell you well david barnson is a christian um and uh, i'm not commending any particular investment philosophy here except to say that the book of proverbs says in one way or another if you try to get rich quick you'll fail if you gather little by little you'll increase it and david barnson's uh, investment company uh, as far as i can make out from listening to his podcast and reading this seems to be founded on principles that resonate very strongly with that christian wisdom and if um, the analysts are to be believed he's doing reasonably well um, so uh, i will leave um, the appraisal of this to people more qualified than I to assess it. But let it nonetheless be said that what he seems to be doing in here, as far as I can make out, is laying out an approach to the really nitty gritty practical aspects of investing for your retirement that is consonant with and resonates with biblical teaching about not being covetous and being ready to accumulate little by little and not trying to uh, smash records in your investment portfolio but nonetheless to just build patiently steadily over time so that you can provide for yourselves and for others okay so what else we got 
Matthew Walker, uh, Why We Sleep, um, he gives to his beloved sleep. And Matthew Walker, as far as I know, isn't a Christian, certainly isn't writing as one. But this book, you wouldn't have to agree with everything it said. And medics and clinicians and psychologists and sleep experts will find plenty to disagree with in here. But you don't, don't have to agree with everything he says to find it really um, uh, thought provoking. And it certainly changed one or two of the aspects of my own family's life. We've, we've tweaked our routine slightly to try and fit in with um, the physiological insights that he brings. And it seems to make me and my wife and my children's lives more productive um, and certainly more uh, rested. Um, so again, I'm not pretending to be an expert on sleep. In fact, I'm saying I'm not, but I'm saying that he is. And again, read it with a critical spirit, read, not critical spirit, read it with a critical eye, uh, biblically appropriately critical eye. And you may find all kinds of things in there um, that uh, serve as elucidations of uh, biblical teaching in helpful ways. Uh, Digital Minimalism, again by Cal Newport. He's the only guy who makes it into this list twice, I think. Um, uh, choosing a focused life in a noisy world. It's it's a practical series of steps to uh, help us to think through the digital clutter that, that gets in our, uh, in our face the whole time if we're not careful. Uh, and to work through ways in which we could more purposefully uh, reap the benefits of those um, technologies without being ensnared by their pitfalls. Again, uh, read it with a critical eye, but it may have some useful things in it. Uh, noise, a flaw in human judgment. This is also, ah, Daniel Kahneman, yeah, another author who makes it into the list twice, but this time with two uh, co-authors, Olivier uh, Siboney and Cass Sunstein. Um, this is uh, a book about another uh, mechanism by which human beings make poor judgments. I don't think it's quite as good as his... Uh, thinking fast and slow, but it's nonetheless really thought-provoking uh, and helpful. And especially if you're in a position where you're making decisions in business or leadership or in a church context, uh, you want to be aware of um, this because it might just highlight practical ways at the nitty-gritty level in which uh, the book of Proverbs is true in what it says about you need a multitude of counsellors and you need to slow down and you need to think carefully in particular ways in different domains. And, oh yeah, two more. Um, let's do these two. The Distracted Mind, let's do this one first. Um, this is a more, uh, a slightly more scholarly and uh, fulsomely persuasive um, exposition of why it is that we find ourselves distracted and our attention fragmented in the modern world. I found it, well, I'm still finding it really helpful. Um, I'm not yet through reading the whole thing. Adam Gaisley and Larry Rosen. Um, this, I think, is one of the best. It seems, as far as I can see so far, one of the best in the pile. And if I was going to recommend one, well, if I was going to recommend five of these to people to pick up, this will probably be among them. And then finally, sorry, throwing these around, Talent is Overrated by Jeff Colvin. Uh, his argument is that um, a particular kind of uh, well-disciplined practice incorporating regular measured feedback and thoughtful engagement with the results of that feedback and so on is far more decisive in determining positive outcomes in sport and academic life and business and everything else than talent. Talent, he says, is overrated and he has a statistics to prove it. Now, again, you might think, you might find critiques of this that push back slightly, but even if 10% of what he says is true, it may be something uh, worth thinking about and there might, might be things to learn from. Now, just to clarify, again, I'm not saying buy these books, everything they say in them is great and right and biblical. Absolutely not. Listen to the rest of the podcast. And I'll, I'll flesh out why and, and try and articulate a theological framework for that. But what I am saying is, in effect, what we find, I think, in some or all of these works and many, many more besides are fragments of wisdom at the level of detail that may prompt in us further reflections on what scripture says to lead us to a more deep and clear and practically helpful biblical framework for the practicalities of life, for forming in ourselves helpful habits, uh, by putting good structures in place for our daily lives and therefore cultivating in ourselves the right kind of character. I'm not commending everything in them. Uh, just to give one example, and I mentioned this uh, in the rest of the podcast, uh, many of these are, uh, are contaminated deeply with a, uh, an evolutionary framework for the purported uh, psychological developments, which they claim have taken place over uh, many millennia in human development. I don't think that evolutionary framework is right. I think it's a mistaken view of human origins. But still, um, some of the results of the research and some of the claims seem to me to make some sense and maybe they'll be helpful for you. So 
Read them with a critical eye, though not a critical spirit. Um, read them carefully. Read them uh, in the way that I'm going to uh, suggest that you do so in the rest of this podcast. And um, maybe, just maybe, we'll have cause for gratitude to God, even to some of the wisdom that he scattered abroad in the world, coming from, to us at least, uh, from Athens and not just from Jerusalem. Okay, well, that'll do, I think, for us. That's the end of my pile of books, at least, and I have to get back to finishing Sunday sermon. So uh, the Lord bless you. Hope you enjoy the rest of this podcast. And that'll do us for now. Take care and see you next time. Bye for now. Bye. Right, let's pray and then we'll begin. Merciful Father, we're grateful to you for this time you've given us. Thank you for uh, all the blessings that you've showered upon us in our Lord Jesus. Uh, we thank you for the word that you've spoken to us and for the world in which you've placed us. And we ask now that you'd help us to navigate that word and this world with greater wisdom and clarity so that we're better able to strive fruitfully towards maturity in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we pray in his name. Amen. Okay, so you've got this handout in front of you, which is headed, Learning from Unbelievers, which also might sound like a slightly strange topic for a Bible study. Um, This was prompted by a couple of um, considerations um, uh, in the background. And if if I um, just invite you to follow down the the headings on the sheet, you'll see roughly where we're going. So by way of introduction, the immediate and initial background to considering uh, the questions I want to look at tonight and maybe in a couple more weeks is the previous series of uh, Bible studies we've had um, uh, under the heading of Pursuing Maturity in Christ. And you remember that Um, I suggested that uh, one neglected and potentially very fruitful way for us to grow in practical faithfulness is to exploit uh, the biblical picture of what parents are supposed to provide for their children. That is to say, they provide structures for their children, which cultivate in them habits. And please correct that on your sheets. It says wisdom. Actually, wisdom is not far from the truth. It's supposed to say character. I think I've just had a brain fade in the middle of the afternoon. Um, The point is, when a parent raises a child, and we talked about this at great length, they provide structures for them within which they can grow, which will encourage the cultivation of good habits, of uh, practical, wise living. And more than that, will shape their hearts, their character, will create in them wisdom. That heading isn't entirely wrong. And what we really could do with is, uh, going back to school, so to speak, Um, and providing for ourselves some of those same structures. I'm not going to go through all that in great detail because you've heard me talk about it. But we left last session hanging uh, with the recognition that one of the hardest things to do is to work out in any given situation what structures exactly should I put in place to help me to grow in maturity and wisdom and faithfulness as a believer. And you can imagine all kinds of complex situations of adult life, unlike the simple situations of uh, the life of children, where it's really not obvious where you go to devise a structure, say, for example, to help you to overcome uh, a feeling of anxiety when you get into work in the morning for the first hour and a half of your time at work, or to deal with a situation where you come home from work in the evening and um, you're just ratty and irritable with your spouse or with your children, or um, uh, you're at school and you're, frankly you're falling behind where you thought you could be and where your parents think you should be, um, because you don't have the You don't feel like you're able to knuckle down and just work for three hours. And your big brother seems to be able to and your little sister can. But So why can't you? Like They just seem to manage to sit there and carve out the essays and churn over. And and you get distracted every 38 seconds by some beep or happening out the window. Or, oh, I think I need the toilet or whatever. In other words, adult life is complicated. How do we build structures which will cultivate in us the, the habits and character that we want to see? And one way to do this, which is what I want to explore tonight and maybe in the next week or two, is to try to learn from the wisdom that God in his grace has 
scattered around the world around us in the form of writings, uh, old wives' tales, Uncle Jim's wisdom, um, Granny's good advice. That is to say, there is wisdom out there in the world in many different forms, which we could perhaps avail ourselves of to get to grips with some of these um, imperfect habits and imperfect aspects of our character. But the problem from, with this, of course, is that it immediately feels somewhat detached from Scripture. What biblical warrant could there possibly be for listening to your unbelieving Uncle Jim's wisdom about how to do your schoolwork when you recognize that to work hard at school is actually a Christian virtue? Is there any justification for that? Well, it turns out that there is. But in order to articulate why and how it is we should seek to learn from people who are not Christians and what safeguards need to be in place in order to prevent us going off in the wrong direction, I want to set out um, uh, how I think we ought to conceive of this task and how we ought to go about it. And that's the aim of this evening, at least the first part of this evening. A couple of other introductory points. Um, the first thing to note is that learning from Uncle Jim or your grandmother's wisdom or some non-Christian somewhere or other is absolutely inevitable. It can't be avoided. None of you learned to speak or read or write or study or drive or understand postmodernism or put your socks on or do your work or fix leaking faucets or eat with a knife and fork or any of those things by reading the Bible. Did you? In other words, we do want to affirm, and I will be affirming and explaining in a few minutes, the exhaustive sufficiency of Scripture for every matter of right and wrong and every matter of wise and foolish that we could conceivably encounter. But you didn't actually learn to drive wisely by reading the Bible. And in one sense, therefore, I'm not trying to defend the fact that we should seek to learn from people who aren't Christians. I'm accepting and recognizing the fact that we all do and trying to put it in a proper theological framework and perspective so that we understand rightly what God is teaching us. And actually, therefore, so that we don't miss out on other opportunities to learn from people who are not Christians at all. And to do so confidently and cheerfully and don't not feel guilty about doing it, while at the same time protecting ourselves from some of the mistakes that we could slip into if we're not careful. Um, and start, we start thinking that the Bible is somehow insufficient for us. And we don't want to say that the Bible is insufficient, but somehow you can see how we're going to struggle to put these things together. What this requires, and this is a third introductory point, is us to remind ourselves of some things that John Henry's question prompted last week. And really, some of what I'm doing today is to expand and go into more explicit detail and try and clarify some of the things we I met, said in response to that question last week. To articulate what we mean by common grace, general relevance. <laughs> Let me try that again. Common grace, general revelation, and natural law. These are all different things, um, and I want to explain what they are and how they're related to each other. So common grace, um, we're going to come to in a bit more detail um, in a moment, is simply the kindness that God shows commonly to everybody, uh, to the whole world, regardless of what they believe. He causes the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. He causes there to be meaningful regularities in the way the world works, predictable regularities in the way the world works. Um, he causes people sometimes to have good aims and not just to go around slicing each other's throats and stealing each other's hamburgers and so on. Um, he, he graciously makes us less ungodly than we might otherwise have been. Even people who aren't Christians, he does that too. And he causes things just to work in a, an orderly and structured fashion. That's common grace. God is just kind, even to people who don't know him. General revelation is, well, it refers to the way in which God reveals himself in the things that he's made and in the things that he does. Um, 
it includes, in a sense, his revealing his character in common grace. The fact that God causes it to rain on the righteous and the unrighteous is an act of kindness and shows that God is kind. But everything in the whole created order reveals God's character. Um, think of the, the creation as like a uh, glorious tapestry or a work of art and God as the artist. Well, a great artist puts himself or herself into the, the painting, doesn't she? And, and you see some of the inner angst or the joy and excitement or whatever it is that is in the painter's heart, in the painting. Well, God is like that. And so everything in creation testifies of him, rocks and trees and mountains and flowers and everything else, but also the way things work testify of him. The order and the regularity and the structure in the universe speaks of him. That's general revelation. God reveals himself in general things to everybody. Natural law takes that a step further and claims that we can infer moral right and wrong from the things that God has made. You see how these things build on each other. Common grace, God shows kindness just in the stuff he does in creation. General revelation, God is revealing himself in so doing. Natural law, God is revealing moral rights and wrongs that are binding on us and which we could... Um, read out of the creation. The, the, the creation is like a book. And even if we weren't believers, we could just read it. And that is the claim that I want to question at the outset. I'm going to show you in a few minutes how I think we should uh, think about the task of appropriating non-Christian wisdom. But first I need to show you what we shouldn't do. And we shouldn't think of it as an exercise of what's called natural law. And I'm going to explain what that is if you look at the next heading. I need to articulate this in a bit more detail. And uh, this is important in part because um, natural law theory is enjoying something of a resurgence among reformed people. And, um, and also because it's not entirely wrong in everything it claims. So I've got a challenge for you here. What I'm going to do, I'm going to read this brief statement of natural law theory. And you'll see, like, if this was right, this would completely deal with the, the issue of how we can learn things from unbelievers. But it's not completely right, and you have to spot where the problems are. There are some clues further down the page, so don't look further down the page, that's cheating. Cover them up with your hand, right? Here's this, a brief statement of natural law theory, okay? God created and upholds all things that exist, and the created world therefore exhibits a certain order that reflects the character of God. Created things people and animals and objects, are made to operate in certain ways, in certain relationships with each other, and towards certain ends or goals. Taken together, these ways, relationships, and ends constitute a basis for objective moral standards, the natural law, which can be perceived directly by both believers and unbelievers simply by observing the created world. Right. Now, it's quite a dense statement. I'm going to unpack it in a, in a couple of minutes. But first, you've got to do some work for me, okay? Um, now, actually, I, I, let me give you a couple of examples first, okay? Just so you, you, because otherwise you're like, what am I talking about? Okay, so here's, here's how it might work. Um, on the one hand, an advocate of natural law might appeal to Scripture, might say, well, Proverbs 6, verse 6. What does Proverbs 6, verse 6 say? Go to the ant, Pastor Neil. Go to the ant, you sluggard, and be wise. And then it describes the ant, and it, you know, all day long it works and works and works and doesn't have anybody bossing it around to tell it what to do, but it's very productive and fruitful. So if you're lazy, sluggard, go to the ant, you see? So a natural law proponent might say, well, look, if you can learn from ants, you can learn from Plato, and you can learn from Aristotle, and you can learn from modern psychotherapy, and you can learn from business productivity gurus go to the business productivity guru you sluggard yeah can you see it just totally solves the problem if natural law theory is right we have a sound theological basis for reading a whole bunch of stuff that's written by unbelievers and expecting to find christian wisdom in it godly wisdom in it another example and um, this is richard hooker richard hooker would say if you look at the world it's obvious that people are made for 
Uh, lifelong heterosexual marriage and raising of children. That's obvious. You just look at the world, right? Men and women, they kind of, you know, they work together and, you know, if they stay together for life, that's good. And, and then if they raise children, that's kind of, it's obvious that that's the way things are supposed to be done. The raising of children is the end for which men and women are designed and so on. And so you say, look, you can just read off the structure of creation. You don't need the Bible. Put the Bible away. And you can see in the fabric of created reality that men and women ought to marry each other for life and raise children together. Yeah? That's what you say. Right, so let's go through this statement uh, one line at a time. And you tell me whether you think that's right or that's wrong. And we'll see if we can, you can spot the problem. Okay. God created and upholds all things that exist. Any problem with that? Are you all happy with that? Sure? Really? Okay. Good. And the created world therefore exhibits a certain order that reflects the character of God. Is that right? We're all happy with that? Sure? Well, there's sin in the world. Ooh, all right. Go on, say again. There's sin in the world. There's sin in the world. Okay. So... Let's get, hold on, pen. So what would you want to say to nuance that the created world exhibits a certain order that reflects the character, character of God, but what? Go on, that, no, Samuel. Well, well, that certain order has been, um, shall, shall we say, messed up. When, when sin first polluted the world, and so there is an element of chaos that is causing a bit of trouble for that world. Right, very good, very good. So that's the first problem, or at least we've got a question mark over this, this part of the, the, the statement of the definition of natural law theory. As they were created, all created things have this perfection and order in them, but not as fallen, not necessarily. At least people certainly don't. So we've got to I've underline that, okay. Created things are made to operate in certain ways, in certain relationships with each other, and to cer towards certain ends or goals. You happy with that? As they're created, so if we keep Samuel and uh, Mrs. Bennett's caveat in mind, the fall problem, you happy with that one? Things are made, rocks are made for all kinds of things, but not for smashing your sister on the head with. Yeah. Well, this also says that in certain relationships with each other, it doesn't mention the creator. So right. The obligation to the creator. That's true. Missing. That's true. So there's, there are things missing from this. So I've stripped out everything that's not essential to natural law theory. Um, one of the things that natural law theorists would say is that the creation does point us back to God. And there's grounds for that scripturally as well. But then, of course, you've got exactly the problem you mentioned, Samuel, Romans 1. The problem in Romans 1, and we talked about this last week, is that people don't perceive God as they should. Right. Taken to... Okay. Um, let's try and say this with a straight face. Let me try. Okay. <clears throat> I think I can manage. Taken together, these ways, relationships and ends, you know, the way the world works, the way things work together, what things are for, the goals of things, constitute a basis for objective moral standards. The natural law... Now, this is a tricky one. You happy with that? Go on. You can't, so there's a leap between what the world is created to do and be and the relationships and the ways and the ends and what it is. Right. It obviously cannot be observed because both because the person observing it has fallen and also because the world is not operating as it was created to operate. Right, very good, very good. Um, so Mr. Miller's, uh, skipped ahead half a sentence, which can be perceived directly by both believers and unbelievers. Right, that's a problem. It's actually true that there is in the created order, um, as God made it, a structure that corresponds with objective right and wrong. To put it another way, if everybody always did what the Bible said all the time, they would be going along with the creation, the way things are supposed to be. That, that's, that feels more easy to, to affirm, doesn't it? There's a, a fittingness between what the word of God says and what the world is actually like. In that sense, there is a law 
if you like, written into the fabric of nature. If a man and a woman do get married, stay married for life and have children and raise them together, they'll not only be obeying the Bible, they'll be, it's just the best way to live. Like if you're a man and woman, you're married, that's the best thing to do. It's not best to do what chimpanzees do, which is for the woman to partner with as many men as she possibly can in the hope that um, when the, the young chimpanzee is born, all the men will think that it might be his offspring, therefore they won't beat it to death and eat it. Right? That's not the best way to do human relationships. But it's how chimpanzees do it. Right. So there is a fittingness between what the Word of God says we should do and how the world is, a moral fittingness. But the problem is, Mr. Miller, you've highlighted it, bang on, which can be perceived directly by both believers and unbelievers simply by observing the created world. This is a problem. So there are two problems we've isolated. Can you see? There's what I want to call the corrupted world problem. The world is just not as it ought to be. And there is the flawed perception problem. We don't see things clearly as we ought. And we talked about both of these last week. Let me just run through them briefly. I mean, the, the, um, it, it's just kind of interesting. Uh, scripture does not say that chimpanzees are sinning when they do what they do in their male-female relationships. But if we were to read from that human relational norms we would very easy draw, easily draw mistaken moral conclusions. Is that a problem with chimpanzees or a problem with us? I, it's not obvious to me that it's actually a, a problem with chimpanzees. It's a problem in our, our perception. To put it, to make a simpler example, um, why don't we learn, why don't we send a sluggard to the sloth? Yeah? Go to the sloth, you sluggard, and be wise. Just chill out. <laughs> sleep 18 hours a day and eat leaves the rest of the time you know in other words um it's not there's a there's a mixture of issues here there's there are things wrong with there are certainly things wrong with the human world i mean it's definitely the case that if you look around fort worth and you you close the bible try to ignore the bible and then you look around fort worth and try to infer moral standards from the way people behave you get a whole mishmash of mostly bad and some good things right and certainly in the way that we perceive things we're likely to be inclined to selectively appropriate bad lessons so we have a problem both in the fact that the world itself has gone wrong it's not as it ought to be certainly among humans and part of that is that we perceive it incorrectly so the result is like it's it's kind of interesting um it isn't the case that men and women the world over actually uh, have monogamous heterosexual marriages for life and raise children together. That's just not what happens. In the absence of scriptural revelation, people have picked up all kinds of ideas about mostly polygamy and non-heterosexual relationships, which have been ruinously destructive for human society. The, the, the supposed moral consensus among humanity, there is a moral consensus, but it's not as broad as you might think. So here's the problem with natural law theory. Can you see? If, if we're supposed to take seriously what non-Christians say, because we want to cultivate habits that will shape our character, and we think there might be some wisdom out there, but we can't do it because we think that Uncle Jim or your non-Christian great-grandmother has read wisdom from God out of the creation. Because she might have done, but she might not have done. And there's no consistent way of determining. And in fact, if you think about the ant and the sloth, why do we send sluggards to look at ants and not sloths? Think your pardon? They're more industrious, yeah? Right. The word of God tells us. Right. Because the word of God says, go to the ant, not to the sloth. Yeah. So, so to use those sort of biblical texts as an argument for natural law is cheating, really, because you're sort of sneaking in a bit of 
God's word by the side door to, to tell you which bit of the creation to read and in what way. So we need something else. We need an alternative way of proceeding if we are to try and take seriously anything that we might learn from unbelievers. And I'm going to try and explain what I think it is. Everybody um, with me so far? Any questions? Isn't that what we Mm-hmm. Right, exactly. That's where we're going. And I want to, I want to give you a, a way of thinking about that that will be helpful. So exactly, yeah. <laughs> All right. So first what I want to do is um, I'm going to read... Well, uh, what's the best way to do this? Um, I'm going to read this paragraph from one of our doctrinal standards. And you'll see bits of this explanation popping up in everything that follows. This is from the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is one of our reformational uh, confessions. It's uh, chapter 1, section 6, and here's what it says. The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life, is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary con- consequence, sorry, by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture, unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelations of the Spirit or traditions of men. Nevertheless, we acknowledge the inward illumination of the Spirit of God to be necessary for the saving understanding of such things as are revealed in the world, in the Word. And that there are some circumstances concerning the worship of God and government of the church common to human actions and societies which are to be ordered by the light of nature and Christian prudence according to the general rules of the word, which are always to be observed. Right, now that is a spectacularly condensed and insightful statement. It takes 17th century Englishmen to produce something like that. The like of which we haven't really produced since then in Britain. They all went to America. Um, <laughs> though they hear I understand. Anyway, so let me highlight a few aspects of this which um, uh, are worth drawing out in a bit more detail. Um, I'm going to move down the page. to the, There are three theological foundations I want to draw your attention to first. The exhaustive ethical sufficiency of Scripture. The Bible tells us everything we need to know about everything that matters. And everything matters. Let me say that again. The Bible tells you, us, everything we need to know about everything that matters. And everything matters. Brackets. Potentially. We'll come back to that in a second. Just turn with me to, um, I want to show you a couple of scriptural texts which may be helpful. Turn with me to 2 Timothy 4. I can still remember the day that the Reverend Vaughan Roberts caught me up short on this text when I thought I had a question that he couldn't answer. It was a long time ago. Um, I was an assistant at a summer camp where he was one of the, the overall leaders and and he was, um, he was talking about this. And, and I, uh, I came to him after he'd given this talk. And I said, is it, is it really true that the Bible tells us what we need to know about everything that matters ethically? Because, I mean, and then I listed some examples. What about you know, this, that, and the other thing? And he, and he, and he turned, we well, didn't even turn to it. He just had it in his head. He referred to 2 Timothy um, 3, verse 17. And he said, every good work? I've never forgotten that moment. Um, Just look what Timothy says, what Paul says to Timothy, sorry. Um, Verse 16. This is 2 Timothy 3, 16. All scripture is God-breathed, literally. Breathed out by God. Paul invents a new word here. Um, like God breathed is literally what it says. And profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. And so far, I was, I was kind of 
singing from the same hymn sheet. I was like, yeah, the scripture is profitable. It's useful. It can train us, teach us, rebuke us, correct us, whatever. So that the man of God may be competent. So wise, faithful, competent generally. Equipped for every good work. Now just think about that. What that means is there's no good work which could conceivably be required of us at any point, any time in our lives for which scripture is an insufficient guide. Because it says scripture is God breathed and sufficient. So the man of God may be equipped for every good work. And I've mulled over that for years. And that and it started to crystallize for me a, a few years later. Because I was musing on Try and, try and imagine a, a moral, uh, sorry, an action where it's really hard to see how it could be a, a right or wrong action. Like, what colour socks are you wearing today? What colour socks are you wearing? I mean, I'm wearing black socks. White-ish. <laughs> um, green, I don't know. How is it conceivable that the colour socks you put on could be a moral action. Well, it's quite easy to imagine, isn't it? If it's your brother's wedding day, and, you know, they've spent a lot of time preparing all the clothes and the suit and the tie, and you decide, red tie, you know, um, red handkerchief here, all the bridesmaids are in red, all the orders of service are going to be in red. There's all going to be these like little red flashes, exactly the same shade of red, which is just like um, Samuel's T-shirt right there. And you're going to put green socks on. Right? Imagine that with your future brother's mother-in-law, okay? That's going to go down like a sack of something bad. Lead. Can you see? What, what, what it highlights is every action that we could do apart from actions that are just not even conscious like sleeping breathing while asleep right but any action that we do consciously has circumstances related to it it has uh, intentions associated with it it has relationships associated with it and even a trivial looking action will have moral aspects to it because of the goals or the intentions or the motives or the relationships that you're in when you're doing it. And scripture, Paul the Apostle says, is entirely exhaustively sufficient for every single moral aspect of every action that we could do. The problem is, you search the Bible in vain for instructions about what colour socks to wear on your brother's wedding day, don't you? So then you turn to Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 1, section 6, and you notice the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for, and see what, he, what they say, his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life. That is like everything. And faith is not just, just so you lo- learn to trust in Jesus. It's the life of faithfulness and living a life of faithfulness, faith and life is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture. Now, what does that mean? By good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture. Go on. Anybody? Beats you. I I have a friend who wrote his master's thesis on the phrase good and necessary consequence. I have some cool friends. (laughs) Seriously. (laughs) It's Andrew Nichols. Remember Andrew? Andrew? Yeah, he's now a professor of pastoral counselling. So this stuff comes in handy. Good and necessary consequence, John Henry. Let us say study and work and wisdom to examine the scriptures. Right. So study and work and wisdom to examine the scriptures. Yeah, but I've really, I mean, I've read the Bible a few times, so have you. Still nothing about green socks, red socks, wedding day. What's good and necessary consequence? Yeah, John. Potentially good intentioned, i.e., like, while you are... Um, Basically, you are approaching it from a Christian perspective informed by the Bible, and necessary, i.e., nothing else could be deduced from it. And it is a, it's a necessary consequence of what is written in Scripture. Right, okay, so, yeah, that's very good. 
Very good. Necessary consequence of what is written there. It's, it's a logical point, actually. Back in the 17th century, Englishmen were trained in Latin and formal logic and the sort of useful and productive things that classical Christian educators in America are now teaching their children. Have you done any formal logic? Hands up if you've done any form. Yeah. Yeah, you see, you have. This is why you... So good and necessary consequence is a little bit like this. Jerry is a cat. Uh, all cats are loathsome creatures. Therefore, Jerry is a loathsome creature, right? Of course. Once you know that all cats are loathsome creatures and Jerry is a cat, then you know the phrase Jerry is a loathsome creature is not formally contained in the premises, is it? In the, those two statements. But it is latent within them. It's it follows logically, we would say, doesn't it? If it's the case that all cats are loathsome creatures, and if it's the case that Jerry is a cat, then it has to be the case that Jerry is a loathsome creature. There's no, and Jerry's loathsomeness is built into those statements that don't mention Jerry is a loathsome creature. Right? Now, Scripture is like that. And a, a correct logical inference from Scripture is as binding as scripture is. Yeah? You with me? So, it might not say in the Bible that you should not wear green socks on your brother's wedding day when his bride-to-be has spent hundreds of hours choosing the precise shade of vermilion for everything else to be, including your socks, right? It doesn't say that. But it does talk about all kinds of other things like um, loving your neighbour, particularly, like um, uh, honouring uh, men and women who are older than you, like respect for authority, like all kinds of other things, which if you kind of compiled them together, and then especially if you approach the scripture with the, the right spirit, would naturally force you to con- the conclusion that the Bible says you should wear red socks on your brother's wedding day if he's asked you to. Like you could... It doesn't say it in as many words, but it says it. And we say, we say this all the time. The Bible says you should do your homework as well as you can. Well, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. It just literally doesn't. But it does, because it says always, um, uh, whatever your hand finds to do, Ecclesiastes, work at it with all your might, Ecclesiastes 9.10. Um, uh, it says that we all have a calling or a vocation, Genesis 1, and, and whatever we is our vocation. We're supposed to pour ourselves into it and we're supposed to see ourselves as serving one another and serving the Lord as we do so. And so obviously it says that you should do your homework as well as you possibly can. So good and necessary consequence, that phrase was inserted by the Westminster Divines because they realised that scripture applies to every moral action in that way. Yeah, Pastor Neil. This also applies to the fact that we do not have a single wet baby in the Bible right. or a woman taking the Lord's Supper. We do those because they're derived from good and necessary consequence of that which is explicitly stated. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so lots of uh, doctrinal matters. Like the Trinity and certainly infant baptism and women receiving the Lord's Supper, they're not there in as many words. But they... Given what scripture says, you you shouldn't believe otherwise, and you can't logically. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Notice also, sometimes people try and draw a distinction between right and wrong, or ethics on the one hand, and wisdom on the other. This is kind of interesting. Um, You can see that there is a difference, isn't there? Like there's a... um, Stealing, telling lies, committing murder, that's just a matter of ethics, right? Right and wrong. Which university should I go to? Or should I go to university? Okay, that's a, that's a question which, as it's framed, looks like a wisdom question, doesn't it? Because some people do go to university, some don't. And those who do, some go to one place, some go to somewhere else, and, you know... So what sometimes happens is people say, okay, that's a wisdom issue. The Bible doesn't really speak to that. Well, be careful. 
Because once you start to flesh out the details of the situation, what you'd originally said, that's a wisdom issue. It isn't a wisdom issue because it requires wisdom. But once you start to specify the details with greater precision, you realize the Bible speaks to those details. So somebody who goes to a a school that's going to cost $60,000 a year, whose parents have got that saved, okay, well, financially, it might be expensive, but it's not uh, ruinous and it's probably not foolish. Whereas somebody who's going to incur a quarter of a million dollars of debt to get a media studies degree from some college that nobody's heard of, it's like, okay, is that just wisdom or is that actually just yeah, can you see what happens is wisdom starts to merge into right and wrong to the degree that it becomes clearer, self-conscious. You get down to the nitty-gritty details. And so I want I, I want to encourage you. We do need to pursue wisdom in lots of ethical questions that seem unclear and complex. But the fact that we think it's a wisdom thing doesn't mean the Bible doesn't speak to it, and doesn't mean you couldn't be sinning by doing something foolish. Is it a sin for me to spend $100,000 on a new car? Yeah, that's actually a sin. It just is. Because it is so foolish that it's, it requires, in order for me to do that, I would have to break so many simple, straightforward commands of Scripture. But how much should I spend on a car? That's a wisdom issue, isn't it? Yeah? Well, yes, it's a wisdom thing. But it's not, therefore, a non-right and wrong thing. Even issues of wisdom get to the point of being clear-cut ethical issues in many cases when you get down to the nitty-gritty. Does that make sense as well? So in other words, what we're saying here is Scripture really, 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 really applies to everything, pretty much apart from, apart from breathing while asleep. You, know? you can do that in any way you like. <laughs> now... Um, the other uh, couple of things to remember, okay, so uh, as theological foundations, so scripture provides all of this richness of insight. So why can't we just read the Bible and immediately get all the answers to all our questions? If scripture has latent within it all of the richness and complexity of ethical and wisdom related detail that we need for every single complex decision why can't we just do that go away and sit for a few days with the bible and just figure it out well the answer is um human understanding is limited and life is complicated in other words and this is crucial when we say um the bible doesn't speak to a certain issue we're we're probably wrong when we say I don't understand what the Bible says about a certain issue, then you're almost certainly right. And there's a vast difference. There are many, many, many things, perhaps the vast majority of things, on which Scripture speaks with perfect clarity, and we have no idea. Like human cloning. That's it. You might think that's a really, really straightforward question. Perhaps aspects of it are at least with contemporary technologies. But why precisely? Like could, would it be morally legitimate to clone a human skin cell from my own index finger? If I could just do that, would that be okay? I have no idea how to answer that question. Um, what about eating meat from a halal butcher? You know, halal... Is, is a, halal is a meat that has been sacrificed, uh, sorry, it's been um, uh, uh, produced in a context where a Muslim imam or other religious official has prayed in connection with the, the killing of the animals and the preparation of the meat. So it's, 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 Muslims are allowed to eat it. Are you allowed to eat meat from a halal butcher? Like, you think so? Really? I'm glad you're so confident. I can think of a thousand situations in which you shouldn't, but many situations in which you could. And it's, it happens to be one of the most complex ethical questions out there, actually, to, to work through all the details of how to answer it precisely and why. For all kinds of different reasons. You have to have so much else in place in order to answer it rightly. Here's a question. Let's suppose, <laughs> this is a real question now, 
let's suppose we could find another venue for our church <laughs> meetings, services, where it's at the um, Masonic Lodge up the road. Yeah, this can be really interesting. Because it's, I think that's even more complex than the Halal Butcher thing. Is there something polluted about the physical space? Mm. Probably not. No, no. But, yikes. How many, yeah, how many people might react in all kinds of ways that we wouldn't want to be responsible for reacting? It would be a bit of a shame if I'd rather give the money to another Baptist church that was struggling and only had an evening service, you know. But would it, would it be morally wrong fantastically complicated question. Life is unbelievably complicated. It's not the case the Bible doesn't tell us what to do. It is jolly well the case that we don't have a clue a lot of the time. What we actually have a lot of the time is visceral emotional reactions. And what happens is our explanations or justifications follow along six months later to justify the things that we said when we opened our mouth in response to our emotional reaction. And we might have been right. We might have been wrong, but James chapter 3, we've said it now. Whoops. Yeah. You see, a lot of these things are extremely complex. So, what do we do? Here's one thing you could do. Um, sacred secular divide. You could try to say there's a whole bunch of areas of life for which the reason why there's no biblical answer is because that's nothing to do with um, Christian faithfulness. The Bible doesn't speak to it because it's, it's an indifferent matter. And there have been traditions in um, evangelical churches and in Reformed churches where people have spoken of what's called adiaphora. Have you heard that phrase? Adiaphora. Um, things indifferent. Indifferent things. Um, and what happens is that anything difficult... <laughs> gets dumped in the it's matters indifferent box and what and and you end up if you're not careful you can start creating a way of thinking about the world in which Jesus is lord of about 47% of it because that's all the stuff that matters we've got a sacred realm of faith there's the realm of faith the realm of the sacred and then there's the realm of practical things like where we should meet for worship. That doesn't really matter. It's just a practical thing. Or what you eat. Or what colour socks you wear. It's like it's just a practical thing. It's not. It's just like colour. The Bible doesn't say anything about colour. Is that a, sacred? I've got to trust Jesus and love my neighbour as myself. But practical things. No. We, don't, we reject any sacred secular divides. We reject any kind of divides within creation, actually, ontological divides, because Jesus is Lord of everything. Now look at the Westminster Standards again. Notice how they put this. It's really interesting. The last four lines or so, there are some circumstances. <gasps> what circumstances? Concerning worship of God and government of the church, common to human actions and societies, which are to be ordered by the light of nature. Gasp! They've just let natural law in through the side door. No, they haven't. No, they haven't. Look, look. And Christian prudence, the door is closing, according to the general rules of the word, which are always to be observed. This is fascinating. What it does is it says, even those things, the most nothing to do with your faith question that you could possibly envisage. Our instinct should be to seek connections and anticipate connections to matters of Christian faithfulness. Jesus is Lord of everything. And only entirely unconscious actions are in principle excluded from the realm of right and wrong morality about which scripture speaks okay so given that positively speaking what can we do to appropriate the wisdom that we're going to need to 
um, uh, to proceed with thinking about the kind of complex questions that we've got hanging over from the, the last few weeks. And we talked about this last time, I think. Uh, hands up if you can remember the distinction I drew between um, special grace, middle grace, common grace. Can we talk about that? Um, somebody want to explain to me, what's special grace? God's special grace. What's that? Do you want to help me out with that? The very good. The kindness of God emanating over us, particularly, that is to say, the people of God. God's special grace refers to the kindness that he shows to his people, distinct from the rest of the world. Um, he gave his son to atone for our sins. He has spoken to us in his word, the Bible. Um, he feeds us at his table. He gives us his spirit and equips us for life and godliness by the gift of the spirit and so on. All these things God gives graciously, but not commonly. He doesn't give these to everybody. You have gifts from God that unbelievers do not share because they're found in Christ. Christ is the one upon whom they're uh, poured out and we are connected with Christ and therefore we receive them in him. And that includes vast swathes of wisdom. The entire history of the church's theological and pastoral and biblical reflections on every and any question of ethics and daily life and everything like that. That is a gift of God, which is given to his people. Um, now, that's practically quite useful because it might therefore mean if we get stuck like not knowing whether it's a good idea to eat halal meat or meat in a Masonic hall or whatever else, colour socks I should wear at my sister's wedding, brother's wedding, we might find resources within the church considered more broadly, and sometimes we don't avail ourselves of them very well. Special grace. Middle grace, this is a term actually coined by Peter Lightheart, I think. Have you read that article, um, Pastor Neil? Middle grace and moral consensus. A really, really good article. It's called Did Plato Read Moses? Middle Grace and Moral Consensus. It's a subtitle. Really interesting. I, I can probably find it for you if you want it. And he just points out, and again, we mentioned this last week, that um, God's special grace has a way of hanging around in society even when people turn away from Christ. So your grandmother's wisdom, if your grandmother, like one of my grandmothers was not a believer. Your grandmother's wisdom might have some of her grandmother's wisdom in it, who was a believer. And so you might want to listen to your grandmother, even though she's not a Christian. Ditto um, the legal system of the entire Western world. Right? Uh, vast swathes of the... Uh, the culture that we've inherited and the music and the art that we enjoy, less so music and art since the start of the 20th century, but, but huge amounts of Western culture and parts of the culture of the rest of the world also are the unacknowledged gifts of a formerly Christian past. You know, you go to, you go to um, churches in London that are, you know, you, you listen to a service uh, uh, and you struggle to persuade yourself that, that anybody here has any living faith in Jesus. It makes you really want to despair. But sometimes you look at the church itself and you think, wow, that is a testimony to the, the love for Christ and the, the glory that people saw in the living God in former generations who built this wonderful edifice. And I, we used to go to some of these churches and it was really... The, there's a curious feeling, you know, going to churches where Jesus is not really known. That sounds like a really strange thing, but it's tragically true. But the building <laughs> speaks of his glory as it was embraced and enjoyed by former generations. So what's that? Well, it's not common grace, is it? But it's not quite special grace anymore. It's, it's the grace that echoes down through the generations as a consequence of Christian heritage. Now, a great deal of where we're going to end up this evening, I think, actually comes from that. A great deal. 
a, there's a great deal of wisdom in the secular world, um, which is the unacknowledged fruit of God's work in the past. And people have long since forgotten Jesus. Finally, then, common grace, and we've talked about that. Um, you, you could liken it, and I've done this before, in a, a room full of a thousand dart-throwing monkeys, and there's dartboard, dartboard on one wall. One of them's going to hit the bullseye. And if the one who gets the bullseye gets prizes, and he does so randomly, consistently, then, hey, he might accumulate prizes, and other people might notice, and his books might sell a million copies rather than sort of 50. Okay, I think that's probably happened with quite a lot of modern uh, literature about everything from health and fitness to psychology and education and uh, productivity and workplace culture and everything else. Random dart throwing monkeys. And you know, James Clear hit the bullseye. Right. Um, so before we proceed and turn over the page, I think I want to, I want to encourage you to, to do so with gratitude to God for having, if you like, spoken uh, in many, many different ways, and caution, because uh, there's a central um, step on the diagram I'm about to try and talk you through that mustn't be forgotten. Now, this diagram uh, illustrates all the things that I've been trying to say so far. Can you see it? It looks a bit like a snowman. I just realized that after I'd done it. Sorry about that. So here's, here's how we, you can all see the, the diagram, and if you've got this at home, it might be helpful for you to look at it. Um, here's the, the really superficial way of thinking about how to um, learn about the world and live a faithful life. You start in the box in the middle, what does the Bible say? And you figure out what the Bible says, and you receive the truth and you reject the lies. That's really simple. You start from that box and you go to the right the Bible tells you what's right and the Bible tells you what's wrong. Excellent. That's good. Well, yeah, get used to the fact that that's not how simple it really is, is it? Because what we at least have to start doing is you follow this curvy arrow around anti-clockwise, counterclockwise at the top. Because when you finish reading the Bible for the first time, you've still got some unanswered questions. You notice that in blue? Some unanswered questions. And so you go back and you keep reading what, what the Bible says. And you've got questions and you keep going back and you go round and round and round and round and round. And you keep reading and keep thinking and keep trying to grow in wisdom. And as you do so, you grow in wisdom. So the little old lady who's been reading the Bible every year for 55 years, um, who hasn't heard a sermon that talks about Jesus for 45 of those years, because she goes tragically to one of those churches in England where the only Christian thing remaining is the architecture, is still growing in wisdom because she's reading a Bible every year, round and round in circles. And if you're going to go round and round in circles, those are good circles to go in. Now, what I'm encouraging you to do is also to recognize that we may do the bottom half of the snowman. From Scripture, we have some unanswered questions, and we can take them off to somebody else who may come up with all kinds of answers. And they might be couched in terms which are very, very different from the kinds of things that Scripture says. They might be far more detailed than what Scripture says. They might be wrong. They might be unscriptural. They might be right. Mostly, and most likely, they will be a mixture. If, if somebody recommends a book to you written by a, somebody who's not a Christian, that's not a work of non-fiction, that's not a work of fiction, it will contain some truth and some error. So what are you going to do? The answer is you're going to keep going around in a circle because that book will give you some new questions and also some new suggestions. And you'll go back to the Bible and you'll think, no, 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 that can't be right. But hold on, there's something in this. This looks like a way of fleshing out something that I have read in Scripture. This entire book that I've just read really is an elaboration of go to the anti sluggard and be wise because it's, I forget the name of the book now, um, it's the one I read, I, have, I haven't even put, included in the bibliography, which highlights how significant role models are in forming our character and our instincts and desires. And what I'm suggesting is the right way to think about embracing wisdom from the secular world is that bottom circle. And we can grow in wisdom that way as well, provided that we keep coming back to that central box and asking, what does the Bible say? And what we might find is that there are times when 
secular sources say things with tremendous clarity and detail, and they look, once you go back to the Bible a few times, you realize this is basically an exposition of half a verse from Ecclesiastes and two verses from Ephesians 5. But it's fleshed out in such detail, it's profoundly helpful. And what we're not doing is saying natural law. Uh, What we are doing is saying common grace, especially middle grace, and God's kindness to the church in giving us a standard in Scripture by which to appraise and assess these things. And what I want to do is to whet your appetite by literally reading through a bunch of biblical texts and then a bunch of summaries of books that I've read in the last two or three years. And then I'll tell you at the end, well, I'll tell you now. The question I'll ask you at the end is, where do you want to go from here with this subject? We could just stop at this point and do something completely different. We could do the book of Revelation or something. Pastor Neil could do that for us. That'd be great. How about that, Pastor Neil? That was a scowl, the like of which I've never seen. (laughs) Or we, we could try and pick up one or two of the books that I'm going to refer to and try and explore what they have to say to us. And if there are practical issues that... I'm not going to suggest we do a book study of a book written by a non-Christian, but what I could do is try and bring some of that stuff to us through biblical lenses and show you how to do this bottom circle with it. So let me read. Here's half a dozen biblical texts. And then the books that I've read, or summaries of them, that I think are, roughly speaking, summaries of these texts not summaries, much more detailed elucidations of it. All right. Exodus 20, verse 17, you shall not cover your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or, his, or anything that is your neighbor's. Psalm 127, 2, it's vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Proverbs 4, 25, let your eyes look directly forward, let your gaze be straight before you. Proverbs 13.4, the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. Proverbs 13.11, wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. Ecclesiastes 9.10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in shale to which you are going. Ephesians 5, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. 1 Timothy 4, everything created by God is good. There we are. Hebrews 12. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Right. These are some summaries now of books. And I want, as I'm reading, or no, summaries of bits of, or ideas that I've stuck in my mind from books. And as I'm reading them, see if you can't hear echoes or traces of those biblical texts in them. I'm just going to read through this whole page. You ready? I'll read it quite quickly, like I do. Some things I've learned. Our brains have a natural built-in tendency to respond immediately and reflexively to distractions and interruptions. This tendency must actively be resisted if we are to be productive. That's from The the references in brackets are from the book list at the the end, the bibliography at the back, page four. Many office workers are distracted from their tasks very frequently, as much as every minute or so, and much of the time we distract ourselves The resulting fragmented attention has a catastrophic effect on productivity. That's Cal Newport. There's no such thing as multitasking. That was a shock to me. People who think they're doing it are in fact engaged in rapid task switching with negative effects on productivity and mental well-being. Recent decades have brought us into a new economic world where economic rewards will increasingly be confined to those able to perform deep work involving sustained attention to a cognitively demanding task. Working in this way, whether in the office or on a computer or in the kitchen, on a basketball court, in the workshop or wherever, though cognitively demanding, is in fact deeply satisfying. Better still, you can learn to do it. That guy's name is Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi. What a cool name. (laughs) If you have a task to do that you're really not looking forward to, especially one that's been hanging over you for weeks, do it first. You'll feel much better and the rest of your day will go much more smoothly. The book from that which that's drawn is called Eat That Frog. 
It's from Mark Twain. If, if you've got a frog to eat, eat it first. If, eat it in the morning. If you've got two, eat the big one first. Apparently. So-called, and this was a real shock to me, so-called natural talent is a vastly overrated contributor to success in any field. Instead, well-structured practice over an extended period of time has a far more significant impact on performance in a huge range of academic, professional, manual, sporting, and other domains. That's great news because it means if we're committed, we can all get better at lots of different things. It's possible to train ourselves to be more productive and disciplined in a whole range of domains by making surprisingly small changes to our daily habits. You really, really, really need to get enough sleep for vastly more reasons than you ever realised. Regular and sufficient sleep combined with other forms of well-designed rest and recuperation will actually allow you to get more done in less time. Manual work in particular, rather than simple downtime, provides profoundly helpful break from purely intellectual or cognitive demands. Regular physical exercise has numerous positive benefits on mental health, neurological capacity, emotional well-being, sleep depth and regularity, and much more. Human beings have an inbuilt tendency to make systematically bad decisions in many important situations, either by falling prey to cognitive biases, as Kahneman, or by mistaking randomness for meaningful data, Kahneman and a bunch of other people, and then uh, Nassim Talib, who's a really interesting writer, I think. Modern technology, especially smartphones and social media, has a devastating effect on our mental health, social lives, and professional productivity. It may be possible to harness the rather limited benefits of these technologies while avoiding their pitfalls, but frankly, the jury's still out on that one. Everyday stock market investors routinely make terrible decisions in a futile effort to get rich quick, fueled by a range of bad instincts from complex cognitive biases to simple covetousness. These can be avoided by learning how to make investment choices on the basis of sound economic fundamentals and a proven history of dividend growth. We don't help our children or ourselves by shielding them from all hardship and difficulty. Instead, what we actually all need is systematic ongoing exposure to physical, emotional, intellectual and other demands, since in that way we'll actually grow in our capacity to handle the inevitable demands and pressures of the real world. Nassim Talib again, and also Lukyana from Haidt, who I've mentioned to you before. Such systematic exposure to painful circumstances, provided it is undertaken voluntarily, can be profoundly helpful or even curative to people suffering from mental health disorders such as anxiety and phobias. Uh, Famously, Jordan Peterson in his book and also in his lectures. Effective leadership, whether in the home, workplace, school, church or nation, is not about techniques for getting people to do what you want them to do. It's about cultivating in yourself a mature and well-differentiated, that's Edwin Friedman's phrase, character, so that people will follow you where you lead them right now. Those are summaries of unintentional sermons written by unbelievers in almost all cases I think Cal Newport might be a believer I think he might be a Roman Catholic unintentional sermons written by mostly unbelievers preaching on those biblical texts I just read to you and those are summaries each one has next to it a couple of references to one of the, I don't know, 25 or 26 books on that list, which I found, as I was reading, I was thinking, this feels like the kind of thing that if I were much wiser than I am, I could have figured out by reading Proverbs 13, 11, wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. Or this is the sort of thing I should have figured out. All this stuff about multitasking and, and distraction and fragmented attention, I should have figured this out just by reading Proverbs 4.25. Let your eyes look directly forward. Think, if you had a far better preacher than you have, and he preached a thousand sermons on Proverbs 4.25... Think how he would apply the principle of let your gaze be straight forward. You'd get to all the stuff that you've probably read yourself about the terrible danger of our attention being drawn this way and that by beeps on your smartphone and your email, I've got to check this, and I interrupt myself doing 15 gazillion different things, trying to multitask. You can't do it. You cannot do it. So what, what's happened here? 
I've experienced over the last few years this bottom circle without realizing it. I didn't set out to do this. You're reading all this stuff, and it prompts some questions and thoughts in me, and some of them I think, no, it's not right. All the evolutionary assumptions that are in Peterson and Gaiserly and Kahneman's work, for example. That's wrong. I don't know that's wrong. It's because the Bible says so. But that doesn't mean it's all wrong. And so I read this 800-page unintentional sermon by a Nobel Prize-winning economist, and it's like, oh, well, that's interesting. I think that might be helpful for us as we try to build structures for ourselves that help us cultivate habits and vents godly character. Because it turns out that some of these unbelievers... I've got more of a clue without acknowledging Jesus than we have while acknowledging him. Okay, I'm going to pause there. We've got a couple of minutes left, so if you've got any questions or, or comments, I'd be very happy to try and take them. Or, yeah, Mr. Bennett. I'm with you on pretty much everything you've said. The question on my mind is, human understanding is limited, life is complicated how much does that overlap with the flawed perception and corrupted world problems especially as we are in conversation with others yeah how much does the uh, flawed how much does the corrupted world problem overlap with our failure of understanding and the, the complexity of life as we experience it yeah quite a lot I think Though there are different statements. One is a statement of finitude and creatureliness. The other is a statement of corruption and sinfulness. So if we were perfect and unfallen, we would still be finite. So it would be a long time before any of your preachers got from Proverbs 4.25 all the way to some of the detail that perhaps some of us need. So they're related, but, but they're slightly different. And, and bottom line is we've got both problems. So we have, we're ignorant. We, we don't see things and we don't make connections. And You know, you sometimes read a verse of the Bible and you think, oh, that seems fairly obvious or I have no idea what that means. And it, it feels like it doesn't lead anywhere. And, and it, you know it must lead somewhere. It must lead a thousand places, and you just can't see it. That happens to me all the time. And what we're observing is perhaps by building from the other side, imbibing the, I mean, that's not preempted by saying wisdom, imb imbibing what other people say, your grandmother's wisdom or some philosopher's wisdom, might prompt questions which, or show you things which you, you can then recognize as the outworking of biblical texts and biblical principles. Any other comments? For, yeah, Annika. Yeah, yeah. Memorizing more scripture, maybe the scripture more, or is the ratio thing? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that's a really wise question. Um, how do we make sure that we are actually putting it through an appropriate scriptural filter? And that not, not swamping that. Yeah, exactly. So we don't want to. We don't want to just start. We don't want to become like more interested in pop psychology than we are in the Bible. And I think your, your point about, you say proportions or something, yeah. that's a really helpful one. So I, don't, I, I wouldn't encourage some Christians to read some of the things I've read, read here or listed here. Like, for example, um, I mean, Jordan Peterson is a classic example whose, whose worldview is swamped with evolutionary assumptions. Uh, but, he, but he's all over the internet. I mean, like, and unavoidable and has changed lots of people's lives, including lots of Christians' lives, for the better. Well, how do you, what do you do with that? Well, 
you're on safest ground if you're already most soaked in Scripture. We need to have scriptural instincts. Like you can just, you can just see if something is like, yeah, that's just that's that's stupid. I'm not doing that. But then somebody, because so what's with this thing? So on the one hand, you've got Cal Newport saying work like crazy um, for you know four or five hours a day, and if you can, and then do two or three hours of sort of slower work, or maybe it's three hours of really hard work, and then your brain will be fried, and then just do the the stuff you need, like the admin, just to catch up. And then you've got other people. The kind of Microsoft productivity guys who all the pictures are of a guy wearing flip-flops sitting on the beach with his tablet doesn't seem to do any work at all. How do you know which one of those is wise? Well, come on. <laughs> like Nowhere in the Bible does it say, just chill out and the harvest will bring itself in. That's not a proverb, is it? Really? So if you've got scriptural instincts, you'll be able to see, yeah, you know, Cal Newport's onto something and, and the Microsoft guys didn't make the list here. Because, yeah, whatever. I mean, that's just ludicrous. Um, maybe in your world, but not in any world that God made. Um, so I think you, you, it's a really important point. This presupposes a kind of scripture-soaked consciousness and a desire to grow in the places where we feel like we're running into the sand, which really is what the previous couple of months has been about trying to identify now, where, where are we not living as faithfully as we'd like to? And can we carefully gain some insights from other people about that and feed them into our scriptural reflections? We ought to finish because um, otherwise we'll all be bursting into tears because it will be really tired for us. Um, Evelyn's got a question. Go on. Yeah. Would it be more beneficial to... But like, if there are two books, one was written by a Christian who has maybe thought about it less, is less educated about a certain topic, and like an unbeliever who is like the top of their field and knows what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Which would be better to like go to first? Well, that's an easy question to answer. So, a Christian who's thought about it a bit and read a bunch of books, or an expert unbeliever who's really, really narrow in one field. I've already recommended Mark Horn's book, Solomon Says, until I'm blue in the face. You should all read Mark Horn's book, Solomon Says. So he's not an expert in psychology or neuroscience or um, uh, any of the kind of specialised physical or medical things which is in, are in the background of some of these books. He's a really thoughtful guy and deeply soaked in the Bible. And he's got this tiny, thin little book, which is like $11. And if you've not read it, then we're going to have a stoning on, sta- on Saturday prior to worship <laughs> for anybody who's not read Mark Horns. Yeah, so I'd say definitely. Yeah? Which is why you listen to sermons and stuff. You know, you, you, you listen to sermons from non-experts because it's about Scripture first. And then this potentially could just feed into us. Um, Nicole, my darling, yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So, so when you're reading a great book like that, and it's, it sounds strange to call a book of 130 pages great, but it is. Um, then he's done a lot of the hard work for us. Um, he's, he's. I love Mark. He's just. Have you ever met him? Yeah, I've never met him. But um, anyway. So, okay. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray, and then you, you guys need to tell me in the next two or three days, whether you're interested in exploring in any detail any of the things that I read out in the last 15 minutes. Otherwise, we're going to move on to something completely different because I don't want either to uh, miss the opportunity to help you in some practical ways um, or to linger on things that are not helpful for you. So um, you guys are my priority and you at home, obviously. Um, uh, You're the ones who consume this material. It's you who we're here to teach. So... Um, uh, we'd love to help if there are things you want to talk about. If not, then um, uh, we'll move on and do something else. I'm going to lead us in prayer, and then, is that okay? Wonderful. Merciful Father, we're grateful to you for your abundant kindness to us in not only uh, giving us your word, but in so shaping history that even those who don't know Christ 
are positively affected by your grace, which you show commonly, and by the unacknowledged inheritance which they have received from Christians before them. And we want not to miss out on anything that you are doing in the world. So please teach us and help us to appropriate your wisdom and to view everything that we see and read and hear and think about through scriptural lenses so that we may grow in faithfulness. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.